So I'll introduce Paul Burton, who uh, is part-time with us in data science and also uh, part-time with Newcastle University. And he's going to present on one of the projects that he's doing at Newcastle uh, called Data Shield. So I'll pass over to Paul. Okay, thanks a lot, Seb. Um, I'm, so I'm very grateful to the opportunity to present this. As, I, as you'll see, this is a project that, well, it's been the main project that my group in Newcastle University has been focusing on for, uh, well, basically since 2009. Um, and one of my hopes is that we're at the moment where it's, it's progressing very, very rapidly. It's an open source software project and there have been two releases in the last year and we're starting to get a, uh, a, a, a rapidly increasing user group. Um, and uh, one of the things that I'm keen to do is to uh, explore whether this is something that may be of, of interest to Public uh, Health England. Um, and so this opportunity to present it is very, uh, very helpful for me. Okay, so, right, so what, what I'm going to do in the uh, presentations, first of all, I'm going to talk about Data Shield itself, why it's something that's needed, what it is, and how does it work. Then at the end of the talk, there's two other specific issues that I'm uh, going to quickly mention. As we're going to see, Data Shield uh, has uh, enables active disclosure control, data privacy when you're trying to uh, analyze data. And I want to explore why we should be bothering to do that at all. And then uh, in addition, I want to discuss a slightly thorny issue of centralized analysis versus federated analysis. So whether or not you should take all your data centrally uh, and analyze it there, or should you try and leave it where it uh, normally lies and uh, analyze it uh, remotely. So that that's uh, another thing I want to quickly mention. And then finally, the last slide will give you uh, a sort of web sources for further information about Data Shield. Okay, so um, the key issue about Data Shield, so when it was originally uh, developed, uh, the, the, the thinking behind it related to the fact that we, we were actually a, a big uh, international gr group that was actually led from Canada and we were primarily working on data harmonization so trying to work with situations when you had uh, lots of, of big studies particularly cohort studies or biobanks and you wanted to be able to pull the data together uh, in order to analyze it and the, the main thing that we were trying to deal with was the fact that often apparently similar variables from different sources uh, actually have different meanings in different studies. And the, the whole purpose of harmonization was to uh, try to work out when you needed to do something active to deal with that and when you could or could not actually uh, combine data in those instances. However, that the thinking that was underlying that in, uh, in a meeting in Edinburgh in, in 2009, we basically realized that there was a a separate, totally separate issue, which was that uh, if we wanted to actually analyze and share the data uh, between a number of studies, was there a way to do that that was going to be possible without physically having to transfer the data, making it um, visible to uh, users uh, and trying to prevent disclosure control? So. And what we're talking about here critically is, is individual level data. So data at the, on individual people or some other observational unit, but it's normally people. And in the informatics world, this is often called microdata. So I may use the two terms interchangeably. And microdata are absolutely fundamental to analysis in health and social science. Um, but there are key constraints on being able to share those uh, individual level data and in combining them. And there, in general terms, there are three broad 
reasons why you can't just freely share um, individual level data. So the first one is ethical, legal or other governance restrictions. And so, for example, well, one of the things we all know is that Public Health England data is very carefully uh, monitored from a governance perspective and you're simply not allowed to pass out individual level data uh, to uh, outside Public Health England to the extent that, so for example, in the recent work I've been doing uh, with Seven Sharmini on, um, on COVID, uh, I've not been able to actually look at them at the data on my machine. I've been able to look at some other things, but not the not the raw data. So that, that that's an example of governance restrictions. Other examples include the fact that some nations now will not allow individual level data to go outside their own country. And then a totally different class of restrictions arises from the fact that if you're trying to work with research data, normally nowadays you'll find that research data, if it's well organized, will come from the study and you'll have to seek permission from a data access committee. And one of the issues there is that even though data access committees tend to accept ultimately most of the applications that come to them, it can take quite a long time. And so as well as the actual rules that stop you sharing these raw data, uh, you can in practice end up in situations where it takes a considerable time to get it and really it's just too long to enable you to do what you wanted to do. So that's the first set of reasons why you can't share individual level data. Second uh, reason is the thing that applies over the whole of science and in fact over the whole of academia really, which is the fact that if you've done a lot of work uh, in terms of developing something, uh, which could be a data set or a variety of other things it could be, then there's, in a sense, intellectual property that you've built up in, in that work. And you really might not be very happy to simply take the individual level data that you've generated and simply hand it over to someone else, even though, as some of you will know, that was exactly the pressure that was being put on researchers uh, around sort of 2010 when, when our project was starting up. The, the, there was a very strong uh, pressure for, in the UK from Wellcome Trust and Mark Walpert uh, and uh, in the States from the NIH in that if you had data that had been collected on from, uh, from with public money, then you would be expected to hand that over to a third party repository to make it available to other people. So that's the second reason controlling uh, intellectual property. And that also includes uh, data with commercial as well as general intellectual property value. Um, and then the third reason why you can't just share it uh, is the physical size of the data. And in the domains in which I work, the two biggest areas where that's a problem are when you're working with say genomics data uh, you might well find that the actual data objects that relate to whole genome scans, etc., may be uh, terabytes in size or even exabytes in size. So basically, you really don't want to be physically copying those uh, data around. Okay, so uh, that so that was the uh, the situation, or well, it still is the situation in relation to. Uh, individual level data, um, but we know that individual level data are really important to uh, to use. There are some settings where you can only analyze data if you've got the individual level data. You can't work with the aggregated data. Sometimes you can lose a bit of power if you don't have uh, the individual level data. So there are a lot of reason, reasons why you really want to be able to get hold of the um, in individual level data. So what, so the situation we faced was that we wanted in 2009 a way to do this uh, without actually physically moving the data. And in particular, right from the start, we wanted to be able to do it as well as if you had a single study, we wanted to be able to do it in situations where you had data coming from multiple sources. And the issue here, there's a, a really important uh, issue to recognize that is if you, uh, have data coming from multiple sources. There are there are actually a series 
of different settings, but there are two particularly distinct settings that are the two most common. The first one of these is what's formally called horizontal partitioning. And this is when you've got a series of uh, studies or data sources, each of which holds the same set of variables, but on different individuals. So, uh, for example, if you have got uh, if you've got three cohort studies running in three different countries that have tried to collect the same uh, variables, then uh, they will clearly be have the same variables, but they'll be on different individuals because they're from different countries. And then in that case, you're in a horizontal partitioning setting. Now, this is uh, for any of you who've worked with the sort of data. This is can also be considered a meta-analysis setting um, because uh, basically, in a sense, you want to be able to collect the information that you need from each of the studies and then pull them all together as if it was a meta-analysis. Now, there's a second, and sorry, I should say that Data Shield to date uh, has been very successful at dealing with the horizontal partitioning situation to the extent that uh, we basically focus much less on the vertical partitioning um, because we're constantly needing to be able to provide support and development to the system that's working. Um, vertical partitioning is when the different sources hold different variables on the same individuals. And so, for example, when I worked in Bristol, we had the ANSPAC cohort study. And uh, basically, the individuals in that also had data that could be obtained from local primary care. And they also had information that could be, could, could be obtained from educational data sources. And so that's an example of vertical, vertical partitioning. So if you, if this is also a record linkage setting. If you wanted to pull those data together, you'd need to make sure you had the same individuals linked up from each of the studies. Now, in terms of one of the reasons why we've not progressed as fast with this in data shield is that uh, in order to uh, provide disclosure control in this setting, it's much more difficult than it is in the horizontal partitioning situation. As, as we'll see in a minute, horizontal partitioning actually is fairly straightforward to analyze for this. But if you want to do vertical partitioning, you've got to do repeated rounds of encryption and decryption. So I'm not particularly going to talk about that today. Uh, everything is going to focus on the bit that's our main work. So the fundamental uh, approach to which DataShield adopted was uh, rather than trying to take the data to the analysis, so rather than try to have a central uh, warehouse, we were going to try to take the analysis to the data. So the data would sit on the local servers where they normally sat behind the firewalls, where they usually reside. So they'd be under the control of their usual data custodians. And then uh, analysis and analyses would be actioned by transmitting uh, commands from a central control center to each of those studies and then returning from those studies uh, non-disclosed statistics um, and uh, those statistics could then be combined in order to produce uh, analyses that combined all the studies together um, and the per when there's when there are multiple sources of data so the way there is horizontal partitioning then basically the analysis center, which could, for example, uh, my laptop can be an analysis center for uh, for, for a data shield session. Um, and the purpose of the, the laptop is to effectively coordinate the parallelized analysis across all the sites simultaneously. And in a few minutes, I'll show you how this actually works. It's all, it's all fundamentally based in R. Um, and uh, a key point uh, about data shield as uh, i'll explain later on is it supports both federated analysis and centralized analysis what i've just talked to you about where we say we're leaving the data where it is and then analyze it remotely that's federated analysis so data shield provides a way of in practice doing successful federated analysis um and it, but in addition if you wish you can put all the data on a central um uh, in a central repository and then use still use data shields disclosure control mechanisms to allow enable you to analyze that with uh, active disclosure control uh, final point is that uh, as you'll as we'll see in a few minutes the there's a, a number of ways in which disclosure control is enacted 
And a key point is that all of these uh, actions for disclosure control sit with the raw data. So they sit with the, uh, the remote servers under the control of the custodian who normally looks after them. And so where there are options for what you may or may not be able to do to prevent disclosure, the person who dictates that is the custodian. The analyst cannot have any control over that at all. Okay, so this is how it uh, actually works. So if we first of all look on the right hand side, this is a, a standard multi site data shield for horizontally partitioned data. So here we have six studies, uh, each of which has its own uh, data computer. Uh, and uh, the, the dotted lines around each of those studies uh, show that, that, that those are the, um, the firewalls for those studies. And uh, basically, uh, as I'll show in a later slide, uh, there are specific controls that dictate the commands that are allowed to be passed through to the uh, studies and the results that are allowed to uh, be sent back. Uh, and the role of the analysis computer in the center, which as I say, could well be my laptop, uh, is simply to coordinate the analyses across all the studies. And when we're getting re returns of uh, results from multiple studies, then that central computer uh, dictates how they're combined together to produce an overall result. Now, although we started off with doing uh, multi site data shield in that way, we realized pretty quickly that because of our active disclosure control, we had this capacity to use it, even if there was just a single site. And so we've developed the single site data shield, which is basically using the data shield structure in order to allow you to simply um, have disclosure control on analyzing uh, any data. Okay, I think that's all I mentioned on that one. Okay, so how does it work then in practice? Well, there are three classes of uh, analysis or three classes of functions. Um, first of all, there are function, it, it, all, all data shield functions that, or client side functions that sit on the analysis computer start with DS. Um, and so for example, the function DS table 2D uh, is a function that creates two dimensional tables. In fact, this has actually been replaced by one that will now do uh, tables up to three dimensions. But for the moment on this slide, I've forgotten to change that. Um, and basically, so this one, uh, what happens is that the, uh, the analysis computer sends out a command saying, please do a two dimensional table and says which two variables you want to do it on. That gets passed to each of the data computers. They create the data the table for their study and then return that to the center. And because it's a table, uh, it's pretty much fundamentally non-disclosive with one exception that I'll just say a little bit about more in a minute. They'll return that to the center. And again, then because it's uh, a table, really the overall table from all the studies is simply the sum of the tables from each of the studies. So basically that is a one step uh, function. And the, the important uh, exception is that as many of you will know and uh, you have to deal with regularly, when you release uh, data in contingency tables, if you've got a low cell count, that potentially can be uh, viewed as disclosive. And so one of the uh, things that happens with DS table 2D in comparison to, for example, the table function of native R uh, is that it basically there's a threshold that, you, that can be set by the custodian that says what is the minimum cell size or minimum non-zero cell size that you're prepared uh, to accept. So that's an example of uh, disclosure control. So it's good. Okay, great. Uh, second uh, types of functions are multi or two-step functions generally. And these are ones where you first of all got to get some bit of information across all the studies. Uh, and then when you've done that, you can then enact a, fun a, a function to do something. So the DSS factor function is an example for that. Uh, those of you who use R will know that factors are basically uh, categorical variables that then get analyzed by comparing all the different levels of them. And in order to, to do uh, as factor usefully in DataShield, 
then uh, you need to know exactly how many different levels that factor might have across any of the studies. So, for example, if you've got um, an, an ethnic group uh, analysis, and basically you're going to divide that up into uh, so uh, white European, uh, Asian, uh, black, uh, or other. Now, if you if one of the studies doesn't have anybody in it who's black because it's a population-based uh, setting, then in that case there won't be any any uh, uh, observations in that study that fall at that level of the factor. And so when you start combining everything together, that will make mathematical models fail. So what has to happen is you first send out a command saying to each study, send back all the levels you've got. Those levels are then dealt with centrally and then every study then creates a factor with all of those levels in, even if they don't actually have it themselves. So that's two level factor. And then finally, which in some ways the most important are iterative analyses, of which generalized linear models are a good example. Um, and in this case, you, you can basically fit these in two ways. One is uh, can be called virtual pooling, which is basically that the central study, uh, sorry, the analysis computer sends out a command to each study, says, uh, please do one iteration uh, of the following generalized linear model, and it specifies what, what regression model it wants to fit. Each study does that one um, uh, iteration and returns, if you look at the top right of the scale of the slide here, these are two summary statistics called the score vector and information matrix. You can see their low dimension, so they're fundamentally non-disclosive. Um, and uh, the, but they are, in this case, of course, sufficient statistics in that they contain all the information that exists from these data about this particular model. And so we can safely return those centrally. Those get sent centrally and they basically, all the score vectors get added up, all the information matrices get added up. Then the score vectors are divided by the information matrix. And it happens to be for anybody who knows about generalized linear modeling, that that particular thing you've then calculated is the update statistic that tells you how much you should update your current estimate of all the coefficients to uh, work out what the, the best guess for the next iteration of the model is. And it, it happens to turn out that in this case, if you use um, most uh, generalized linear models, most regression models, then by doing it the way that I've just said, the answer you get at the end is identical. So it's not just similar, it is identical to what you would have got if you've taken all of the data from each study, put it into the center and analyzed it in one warehouse. So that's one way of putting things together, virtual pooling. The other way to do it, which we are increasingly recommending, is uh, to do study level meta-analysis. So the analysis computer sends out a command to each data computer, uh, says fit this generalized linear model completely. Uh, so it goes through all the iterations in each study, set, return those to the center, uh, and the center then basically combines the estimates or the regression coefficients and their standard errors from each study using either random effects or, me or fixed effects meta-analysis. And that then gives you uh, meta-analysis based uh, estimates of the effects across all studies combined. So, so that's basically just emphasizing that that thing that's just popped up is just emphasizing that we can do this it, it, uh, equivalent to the virtual pooling or to the study level metro analysis. Uh, I won't go into detail, but basically this does completely work. When you use virtual pooling, you do get identical answers to what you get if you move it centrally. And if you use uh, random effects uh, study level metro analysis pooling, then the answers you get are sensible with uh, sensible differences in the standard errors from what you get if you if you do it all uh, using the virtual pooling. Okay, so this this is now, in a sense, the maths of data shield were are not difficult. I mean, they're, they're fairly straightforward generally. The, the thing that was much more difficult was to work out how to actually implement this. So this is a diagram from a paper written by uh, Becca Wilson uh, 
and uh, Ollie Butters and a series of other people uh, in the group um, where they described uh, at that point what was the stand, standard structure that we had then. So this is in more detail than the, the slide I showed you earlier. So the way that it works then, so I, I would sit here on my laptop as a researcher and I'd be running a standard uh, R environment um, and the only addition to that R environment is that there would be a whole series of what are called client side functions on there. So these are data shield functions that have been set up, set up, sit on a normal R environment and allow me to control the data shield analysis. So I'm going to be sending commands out from there. And these commands are first going to a client portal. And uh, when we first, one of the first development uh, areas, sorry, ways of developing data shield in the first place was part of a big project called BioShare EU, a, uh, a, a, a European Union project run from uh, Groningen in Netherlands. And so we had a, a client portal, which was a server sitting in Groningen. And uh, that, that, that server knew that it could receive commands from, say, my laptop from anywhere in the world. So it was, it was flexible in terms of, of receiving it. And it was going to receive those commands into uh, an RStudio uh, instance that was sitting on the on that client portal, and that's what I was going to be typing my commands into. That then linked up to uh, each of the studies. There were 14 studies, in fact, in that particular analysis, of which we've shown three here. Um, and so the client portal, uh, as well as knowing that it might receive commands from anywhere, it also knew that it only had to give pass those commands on to 14 different sites. So each of one of which had a, a server that was called an Opal server. Opal is a, um, a MongoDB, uh, no SQL data, but databasing system developed by Abiba, which is a major um, informatics component of the DataShield project. And they're now based in France. Um, and each of those servers, uh, you, you can see, so for example, for Opal 1, there is, first of all, a, a picture of a server, which is, in fact, there is the main study server. So it's the, where the data was sitting before the study wanted to serve it, sent, save it. So it could be in any format whatsoever. And the first thing that happens is that then gets read into the, um, to, into the uh, Opal server and gets put straight into R as a data frame. So basically, the data is taken uh, from whatever form it's uh, been put and made available uh, into the uh, into the R server, and once it's in there as a data frame, it can then be uh, analysed. Second thing to note is that you can see um, blue and green arrows. So the green arrows are the commands coming in, and they're going through a firewall. And uh, as we'll say, see in a second when I discuss the disclosure. Basically, every time they, once they've gone through the firewall and are meeting standard uh, disclosure controls set up in any firewall, they pass into the Opal and go through an R parser. And that R parser does two things. It checks there are certain characters uh, from the character set that it will not allow through. So, for example, it won't allow a character that looks as though it's trying to assign something uh, in case that's being used to. Uh, do something bad on the uh, on the server, um, and in addition, we uh, are the whole of the basis of the uh, analysis in Data Shield is based on what are called server side functions, which are functions that have got disclosure controls within them. And basically, every time you write a new server side function, it gets added, so it's recognised by the parser as being a valid function. And uh, in addition. The arguments that you're allowed to use with that parser, with, with that function, are also specified. So things will only pass through to the uh, R parser if they're allowed. Second thing is that the, the blue line then shows the results coming out. And so these are the uh, low dimensional summary statistics that we use uh, to drive the analysis centrally. And they can be as simple as a mean or a standard deviation, or they can be more sophisticated, like the score vectors and information matrices. So these all go into the central uh, client portal, uh, and basically the uh, that, that then uh, the client side functions there 
then combine them together in whatever way is necessary. So if that's a table, it simply adds them all up, like I showed. If it's a generalized linear model being fitted with a um, virtual pooling, then it will be adding up the score vectors and information matrices at each iteration, and then finally it will pull them. Uh, and then if it's a study level meta analysis, it will take all the results from the studies and do a study level meta analysis on it. So that's basically how the um, th that's all working. And it's all based in R, which is open source, or in Opal, which is Obiba's databasing system, which is also open source. So this is all open source freeware. Now, the, the key issue here is disclosure control. So it's obviously federated, so that's one issue, but in addition, we've got the disclosure controls. And so what are those? So first thing to say, we've already mentioned one, which is that the uh, commands will only go through if they're allowed by the parser. Second thing is um, that those that server side R, unlike the client side R, which is on my computer and is completely normal, the server side R can only receive commands through the Opal uh, and therefore ultimately from the client side portal. So basically nobody can get in there and do something else commanded from anywhere else. Secondly, the server side functions don't allow any disclosive output. And so obvious ones of those are, there is no DS print function. So you can't print the data, uh, the raw data, because that obviously would be disclosive. And slightly more sophisticatedly, if you've fitted a Glim model, uh, you're not allowed to see the Glim residuals or the, and fitted values, because those also would provide a list of all the uh, outputs for everybody in the study, so they will be disclosive. So every time we add a new function, we have to make sure it doesn't have any disclosive bits. Then within each of the server side functions, we have disclosure traps, for example, like the minimum cell size. We also test to make sure the mathematical model is not too uh, complex, because if you if you oversaturate a model so that the number of uh, observations is, is either equivalent or not much more than the number of parameters, then that starts becoming disclosive. Uh, crucially, the data custodian controls the trap thresholds. Uh, and then, then the final uh, additional saving things are that, uh, sorry, disclosure controls are that all commands that are sent and output are recorded and logged on the remote servers. So there is a permanent record of what's actually happened. So if someone tries to get around the disclosure controls with some clever analysis, that will be permanently recorded. And we could, if necessary, then go back to investigate how someone managed to disclose something. Um, and if they have done it in a way they shouldn't have done, then we can potentially introduce sanctions. Uh, another really key basic part of disclosure controls is they you don't just stick data shield up. It needs to be part of a more formal governance agreement. And so basically uh, everything has to be set up uh, in sensible ways. And clearly this is what you'd expect from the GDPR. And one of the issues about Data Shield, by complete convenience for us, is that the uh, with the, the, the onset of GDPR, Data Shield provides a way in which you can really meet a lot of the, um, the sort of uh, ambitions of the GDPR without stopping you being able to analyze data. Uh, the final point to say is that uh, you would never actually attach data shield to your main database. So for example, you wouldn't attach it to the data lake in Public Health England. What you do is you'd make sure that there was a, a smaller data set that contained just the data you wanted to share. And that sat somewhere separate from your main data. Theoretically, that could be in the lake, but it shouldn't be anywhere where it can be connected back in uh, into other things in the lake. Uh, final thing that I probably I should have said before saying all that is that what do I define as disclosure risk? The disclosure risk is the risk that a data analyst is able, either by accident or deliberately, to infer the identity of one or more of the individuals being analysed and or to infer the value of key variables characterizing those individuals. So basically that's what we're trying to present. Now I'm gonna, well, I'm not gonna say much about that. The, this is basically just a list of our main users. And basically at the moment, the main users are big cohort studies 
uh, across Europe and Canada. Uh, basically, there's more, at the moment, there's more than two and a half million people in the studies that these are linking up, and they're part of various uh, consortia, largely uh, funded from the European Union. Um, but one of the things that we're very keen to do is to start introducing this into health service settings. Miracum is a German network of hospitals where it's being used uh, in that setting. And this is one of the reasons why I'm keen to explore whether Public Health England might be interested in this is that I think potentially Public Health England would provide another venue where uh, health service or health care data uh, from other sources could be uh, usefully uh, worked with, with Data Shield. Um, I, I think rather than uh, going through these next two few slides, I'm going to leave you with the last slide. 